Hello, appreciate you joining us. I'm Patrick Prince, joined by sports columnist Bill Haston and OSU beat writer Tyler Waldrop, beginning his second week with us at the Tulsa World. And uh, breaking news out of Stillwater, Mike Boynton, OSU men's basketball coach, is out after seven seasons in Stillwater. Uh, his overall record was hovering around 500. His Big 12 record was around 400. He went to one NCAA tournament and two NITs. Uh, Bill, your initial reaction to the news? Well, it's, uh, you know, if, if you if you eliminate or if you don't consider the Cade Cunningham season, Patrick, of 2020, 20, the 2021 season, um, yeah, the, the program is essentially a 500 program with Mike Boynton, and that's just not good enough because, I mean, it – in any discussion about Mike Boynton and the OSU basketball program, it's always starts with he's the best guy for the job. He's the best person to represent this school and to be the CEO of our basketball program. He just doesn't win enough. And, you know, I, I mean, it, the numbers speak for themselves. I mean, uh, Mike Boynton – is about uh he, overall uh and you know what let's just let's look at the bigger picture because this will help us frame uh this job uh and whether it's even a good job uh in the power five but since eddie sutton had his car accident in 2006 tyler the cowboys have been coached by sean sutton Travis Ford bred Underwood for one season and now Mike Boynton. The overall record of those coaches who succeeded Eddie, 333 wins, 262 losses. That's slightly above 500. And then in Big 12 play, 136 victories, 183 losses. Decidedly below average. Uh, and keep in mind, Tyler, uh, Eddie's last two teams, one went to the final four and 04 and the next year they went to the sweet 16. Um, and OSU since that 05 team has not been back to the sweet 16 and only won two uh, NCAA tournament games since 05. So uh, my reaction, uh, Patrick is, is uh, you know, there's just been this uh, speculation, how important is basketball now? Football undoubtedly is the king of, you know, it OSU is a football school now, which, 20, 20 odd years ago, you couldn't say that. I wish was a school that was trained to get better at football 20 years ago, Tyler. But uh, during the Mike Gundy era, the Mike Gundy era coincided exactly with uh, OSU's slide to mediocrity in basketball. And so now, uh, after seven seasons, a uh, great guy, Mike Boynton, uh, OSU starts over with a search for a basketball coach. And it's a, it, you know, you could say it's a really important hire for Chad Weiberg, and it is. But, and we'll get into this more uh, when I shut up and let you guys talk. But I mean, the NIL piece of this is so, it looms so big in this conversation. Uh, and Mike Boynton made it a point in a Tulsa World interview, what, three weeks ago, to point out that they are in last place, Oklahoma State is, with regard to, the NIL commitment to basketball. So unless OSU really increases that uh, and, and makes Oklahoma State more of a destination spot for, for you know, high-end talent, I don't know that it really matters who you hire over there right now to coach basketball. So, Tyler, nothing like a high-profile coaching search when you're starting a new job. So uh, welcome to town on that one. Good, good luck with all that. Uh, you've been around the program not very long, not nearly as long as you know Bill has and all that. But your your thoughts on the on the move? I mean, I think just on paper, um, you know, Boynton was averaging just over seven Big Twelve wins a year. I mean, that alone, like to me, is you know that's not where anybody wants to be, especially a program like Oklahoma State. I mean, you know, to consistently be aiming for middle of the pack at best in conference play is just, I mean, you're never going to be set up for postseason success if, if that's the best you can do. And, uh, you know, like you mentioned, um, this is only my second week on the job. So uh, while I don't have the most uh, familiarity with the, uh, you know, the everyday 
um, rhythms and routines of Oklahoma State. I can tell you that, you know, I, uh, as, as readers who read my intro column know, you know, I've, I've spent my whole life in the South. I like college basketball. I consider myself a college basketball fan. I have friends that love college basketball. I think Big 12 as a conference is a fun, uh, you know, like if you tell me, hey, there's Big 12 basketball on, to me, that's a fun thing to sign up for. But when I think of Big 12 basketball, I don't think of Oklahoma State basketball. That's just, and, and that's just where I've been, um, you know, for probably the past six, seven years, I probably maybe even a little further back. I haven't, you know, when I thought of, oh, I'm excited to watch how the Big 12 does in March Madness this year. Oklahoma State isn't a team I've even thought of, oh, should I watch them in their conference tournament? Should I watch them in March Madness? Because Oklahoma State hasn't been relevant pretty much. So, um, you know, if, if I have that, you know, if that's my perception of the program as just a fan, I'm sure that that perception extends to potential recruits that, you know, consider what school they want to play for. Let's get into who's next and the NIL component of this in a second. Uh, Bill, I'm really glad you mentioned what you did about Mike Boynton being the epitome of a guy to represent your program and all the things that he has done, the the classy guy that he is. Can you just touch on that a little bit more and then we'll kind of go on to the who's next angle of this? Well, so he was high, he was promoted actually in 2017 after Brad Underwood went to Illinois. You know, what a check this out, Tyler. So Tulsa, downtown Tulsa, we hosted NCAA regional games in 2017. And OSU played against Michigan in a first round game in Indianapolis on that Friday of the tournament week, uh, first tournament weekend. And so uh, OSU loses in a close game to Michigan and we're covering the regional downtown Tulsa. Right. And then oh, around noon on that Saturday, I get a text and it says uh, Underwood's leaving to go to Illinois. He was a first year coach at Oklahoma state. Uh, so uh, Boynton and Lamont Evans were assistant coaches for Underwood uh they both got an interview for the job. Mike Holder interviewed those two, plus Doug Gottlieb. And I believe, oh, and James Dickey. I forgot about that, Patrick. James Dickey yep. got an interview. And then so, and he was also, uh, has a long history with Oklahoma State basketball and former Texas Tech head coach. Anyway, Mike Boynton comes out of the interview process, uh, gets that job. Uh, he's a very personable guy. But I remember, uh, Sitting down with him, uh, he he did a, he did a, a, like a two hour sit down with with a few writers, which I thought was interesting. It, there was no electronic media people; they're just writers, I think. Uh, and I came out of that thinking, wow, I can kind of see how this guy uh, impressed us, you know, the the uh, search committee. And young guy, good looking guy, bright, funny, uh, and then. Like three three months later, or so I'm just I like texting with him and just checking in on him, and found out he had not had a day off for the first 100 days, literally exactly 100 days he had worked somehow, some way on behalf of Oklahoma State basketball, whether it was recruiting or camp doing camps or whatever or off season work or whatever. And so I called him up, interviewed him. We had a long talk that day, and I thought, man. And then you find out he's cooking breakfast at frat houses and sorority houses and he's working the campus, Tyler, and he's selling tickets and he's, you know, and I thought, man, from an energy, if you bundle energy and personality, you can't do better than this. And, but, and that part of it has been sustained this whole time, except that he just hasn't won enough. I mean, the numbers we talked about earlier speak for themselves. It's essentially a 500 program. Uh, and it's like I wrote a few months ago, should the Eddie Sutton era be considered Patrick the standard or is that a fluke? You know what I mean? It Great question. Yeah. I mean, was it just Eddie came along and set an unmatchable standard for anybody else to ever, who would ever come in behind him in that role or should OSU strive to be 
uh, have something that looks like the Eddie Sutton era in basketball. Well, you you could have that, but you'd have to spend, spend, spend. And I just don't. I think they spend, 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 but it's all on football. Football is, uh, Tyler, I wish you could have seen the transformation around here between like 2003 and 2011 in that window when Boone Pickens cut those big checks and that stadium got built. Uh, it's just so – to see it happen that quick – oh, Patrick, you went to school over there. Uh, to, to see it happen that fast, to go from really, uh, you know, a, a not very impressive football school to, to be in what it has become. But in that short amount of time, it was just remarkable. So uh, with regard to who's next at OSU, I mean, I wish I had – I wish I could just sit here and say, Tyler – uh, you and I will collaborate and come up with 12 great names. It'd be guesswork. I don't know who wants that job, Patrick. Uh, I'm not saying there won't be guys who – there'll be a lot of people who want the job, but uh, I don't know if there'll be a lot of really highly regarded Power 5 current assistants or small college established, successful, smaller level head coaches who are going to really want that job as long as it's known that OSU is in last place in the league with regard to NIL commitment, because I mean. Uh, Well, well, Bill, you, you told me somebody last week when we were talking about this, about someone that you kind of liked, who who was that? Well, he's at Northwest Missouri. His name's Ben McCollum. And he's, he's, because I think when we talked, I said he could be the Chris Kleiman uh, of college basketball guy who, who had super success at division two. Uh, and then, and then you know, lights it up at uh, in the power at the power five level. But, um, you know, I was texting, uh, I was I've been texting uh, former OSU basketball guys and saying, you know, who who am I not thinking about? Who would OSU in their DNA who is out there right now coaching basketball? Who am I not thinking about who would be a smart play, a fun name? to to consider for this gig and that's that's a problem too because there's really not any uh not really uh so i have i don't know what in the world uh chad weiberg is going to do what direction he looks i mean it'll be a coast-to-coast search and there'll be a bunch of people apply for it there will be if whether they're actually qualified to win basketball games in the big 12 we'll see uh, there'll be a lot of people who want the job though, because it's a million dollar job in the power five. Tyler, you want to jump in here? Uh, yeah. I mean, I think the, I think you almost have a similar problem with the coaching search that you have with recruiting, um, you know, is, uh, whether it's true or not is the perception of the job that it's not as good as it was seven years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago. And, you know, it typically you see um, assistants, especially highly regarded assistants hold out for jobs they feel they can win at. So if, if the, you know, hot assistants or the um, sort of mid-major coaches that would typically be floated for openings feel that they can't win in the big 12 with, Oklahoma State's current commitment or current situation, then, you know, they might, they might interview, but they might decide to just stay where they are or hold out for something bigger. I mean, the thing is other jobs are going to come open. It's not like Oklahoma State is going to be the only school that's going to be hiring this season. So, you know, I I think, I think the perception of the program is going to play a big deal, not just with recruits, and but also with coaches and I think NIL is a big component of it like you know recruits want to know that the school's going to commit to them and coaches want to know that they'll have the resources to commit to those players yeah so I've been looking at my phone not ignoring I heard every word that Tyler just said I've been looking besides this thought what's kind of a comparable school that was kind of a flatlined in basketball for a while and then really busted out a big amount of money for a coach. And I thought of Bruce Pearl. So, and Tyler, you probably know the particulars on his contract. Holy moly. Uh, Yeah. He's making 
you know, they, uh, now this was two years ago that they extended him, but when they did Patrick Bruce Pearl at Auburn, which is a very, I would say, uh, um, pretty comparable fan base, maybe to OSU is probably larger fan base, but with regard to, you know, the socioeconomic makeup of the fan base, you know, probably very comparable. Right. And in a school that hadn't had much in the way of basketball for a while. Uh, but they gave him an eight year extension worth $50 million. Now that's what it took for Auburn to get back on the map. And they've been really good. Uh, so could I see OSU doing that? You know, rolling out a five year uh, package and paying somebody four and a half million dollars to coach basketball. I, right now I can't because they're, they're on the hook, Tyler. I say on the hook, uh, they are committed to trying to raise $325 million for facilities, right? Facilities, renovations, or development. And so every dime of donor money they can get uh, for that, you know, that's an ongoing every minute of everyday process. And then also NIL, football NIL is like Mike Holder used to tell me all the time, football has an insatiable appetite for capital. He used to say that all the time. Uh, you, you can, there's, it's impossible to satisfy the money demands of any football program. And so uh, it's really sad because basketball used to be badass around here, Tyler. And Tulsa, in any given season, Tulsa uh, would be in the tournament. Oklahoma State, absolutely. OU, absolutely. Uh we had a four-year period in the early 2000s. Tulsa should have gone to the Final Four. They got upset, and I am not overstating this. Tulsa was upset by North Carolina in the Elite Eight in 2000. Tulsa had a better team. That's a fact. Bill Self will tell you that, too. Um, and then in 2002, uh, Oklahoma went to the Final Four. In 2004, Oklahoma State went to the Final Four. Uh, but that used to be year in and year out for us. And for that matter, the women were really good then. OU's women, remember Patrick, went to the 01 championship game. I mean, so I really miss uh, that we had, you know, multiple teams capable of playing into the second weekend or even beyond in March Madness. Uh, and I and just a couple of weeks ago, Patrick, uh, we had a Bedlam game with 12,000 people at at that game. Great game. Great game. OU hits a walk-off shot to win the game. Uh, so when the OSU people feel inspired and rally behind a certain matchup or whatever, they still love basketball and they'll still show up. And it, But but when they don't feel uh, particularly fired up about the direction of the program or that particular matchup, they're not afraid to stay home either. <laughs> oh, now. Because uh, their attendance now, last I checked, they were 12th in the conference in attendance. Tyler, I know you just got here. For OSU to be 12th in attendance is un would have been unimaginable uh, a few years ago. I mean, Gallagher, Iowa, uh, I hope we see it uh, restored to its former glory. Patrick's been to a bunch of games there, and so have I, and it's fantastic when that place is full of people. With a hot opponent, man, there's no place better for basketball. So, I guess that's the uh, decision in university, and it's uh, donors have to make. How important well, is that? Bill, I can't remember if you if you just told me this or you've written it or or both, but uh, you may have said it earlier in, in this video. If OSU, you're right, OSU has a decision to make, but if they're not going to pony up for some NIL, then it doesn't matter who they hire. Like they're going to have to get into the NIL game a little more than they are, right? They're, they're, they just have to. Well, keep in mind, too, it's not like the university opened their books and said, here's what we're doing. And for that matter, I haven't seen the books of any of these schools. I just know what Coach Boynton told me on, uh, you know, whatever, three weeks ago when we talked is that he said there are four or five schools in the league spending at or beyond two million dollars this season on its basket on their basketball rosters, and another four or five spending between like a million and two million. And he said, and he said, we are in last place. We OSU are in last place at about a half million dollars. And um, 
you know, do, do I, uh, I mean, I will never get used to this, uh, model or this concept that the highest bidder gets the talent. I mean, because it, it used to be, you know, you go to a place, uh, because you love the place and you love the coach and, and it can maybe get you ready to play in the NBA and you can have a really good time and have a great college experience. And you're going to be there at least three years, you know, uh, that's gone. The combination of the portal and NIL have, uh, you know, athlete empowerment is important and they should be compensated at some level. But on the other hand, uh, it's, it's, I mean, why are you seeing coaches like Jay Wright from Villanova retire? Healthy, good-looking guy, 60 years old, mm -hmm. winning national championships, and he decides to retire? Come on, man. Nick Saban could have coached 10 more years. He said it himself, Nick Saban, uh, in, uh, uh, you know, said as much a few days ago that, you know, just that he said, I'm not sure – these athletes are hearing our message now because they come back with how much you're going to pay me. So I don't know what the future, I think it's going to be like year in and year out. I think it's, uh, I think you're going to see a lot of seasons like the TCU last year in football, they went to the national championship this year. They were pretty average again. I just think you're going to bring in a lot of new athletes uh, through the portal and you better hope like heck that you get some sort of magic chemistry and it comes together beautifully and you win a bunch of games because half the team's going to be turned over anyway the next year, right? And then you got to hope all over again to get great chemistry. Uh, but the old template of uh, great freshman class, wait till they're juniors. Oh, baby, you know, they're going to develop and we're going to be, boy, two years from now, look out. That template's gone, man. And so – I know I'm ranting uh, because, but I do, I do hate that uh, it feels like for a lot of athletes, now, it is a matter of going to the highest bidder. And that's unfortunate. And that makes me feel like maybe we will never again see another era of great OSU basketball like we saw with Eddie. I would, I would want to push. And again, I know I'm the the new guy in town, but I would push back a little bit on, I feel like, the, this idea is coming through that if Oklahoma State doesn't pony up the money, there's no hope. And I would say maybe from a big picture, long term uh, viewpoint, maybe that's somewhat true. But I mean, at least from what from what I've seen, I like the on the court product seems like it could be better this year. I feel like. I feel like there could be a little more of an identity with this team, even though the guys are young. Um, I don't know. I just, I feel like there are still opportunities to have short runs of success in the NIL era. So if maybe, maybe there is hope, even if from a big picture standpoint, things are bleak that Oklahoma state could have a, a good season or, or a good short run. That's it, it though. I mean, that's that that's kind of what I was trying to say is it is you can there could there's always the potential anytime you put 14 guys together on a roster, there's always the potential that you might, you know, just have a magic run and that and that everybody gets along beautifully on and off the court and you just have a special season. But with regard to program building and sustaining, it, that's what I wonder about, Tyler, is is, is the word program. Is that just you know, is that a relic now? Is that obsolete? I don't know. I don't know. It's, it's, uh, it's Chad Weiberg did make Patrick. He did make a change with the women's program a couple of years ago, but with, if you consider, you know, at OSU, the really big ticket, I guess you would have to include softball in that now for sure. Uh, but the big ticket sports at OSU now would be wrestling football, men's basketball, baseball, and um, softball for sure. So this, anyway, this is a big, big, big hire uh, for Chad Weiberg with unprecedented uh, challenges. Uh, is is Doug Gottlieb going to be a candidate this time around like he was last time? Well, we'll put his name in the paper uh, for sure. 
uh, I don't know. I mean, he, he's been around the program this season, kind of as in a consulting role. Um, I'm hearing that he's actually going to move back to, to uh, Oklahoma or to Stillwater. Um, he was a, a point guard for Eddie Sutton 24 years ago. Um, but he's always stayed pretty close to the program. But, you know, seven years ago, he wanted that job. And I interviewed him that day, Tyler, uh, that Underwood left. I called Doug Gottlieb and said, do you want this job? And he said, yes. And, of course, I ran with it. And uh, uh, But, you know, he's always been around basketball. He's always coached, like, summer basketball. But I've always wondered why, if you're really that passionate about getting into it, why didn't you get into it? Why didn't you become an assistant for somebody? Why didn't you go to start at, so at the end of somebody's bench and work your way into it? By now, he would have been a seven-year veteran of college basketball coaching, Doug Gottlieb would be right now, right? If at that time he says, okay, you know what, I'll go to Pepperdine and be the uh, uh, be an assistant coach at Pepperdine, or I'll, I'll start somewhere at the mid-major level, and by year four, I'll be the top assistant at a good school. And then, and by this time, he would have a seven-year body of work. And this job opens again. He might be, he might be a shoe in for this job by this point. But yet, here he is still juggling media, a media career, and kind of basketball. And so, you know, and I don't know what Doug's age is, but uh, or golly, he's. 47 years old, 46. Um, so, yes, to answer your question, he, he'll get a look at it, uh, whether it's a uh, uh, a serious look. I don't know. I mean, and, and if you're not going to pony up on uh, NIL, if you're going to stay in last place on NIL, you almost think, what do you have to lose? You know what I mean? See what it looks like. Tyler, have you ever seen any of Gottlieb's highlights from his OSU days? Uh, no, I, I can't say. Uh, if I have, I can't say. I the the name immediately associates me with uh, with a certain player highlight. When when you, when you have have a minute, look him up. When you get a second, he was a and Bill remembers a phenomenal passer, mm -hmm. and to me, he was he almost played like a quarterback. Because he would sometimes just throw to a spot, and you'd see Desmond Mason come flying out of the air, and you know for an alley oop dunk or something. He was such a good passer. I mean, great, great court vision. I mean, I mean, Bill, you remember like he was. Oh, he he reminded me, uh, man, who would he remind me of? Uh, kind of a Rajon Rondo, kind of a playmaker, uh, but a very very clever passer. Uh, and, you know, it's funny too, because it, it's always baffling to me when a guy at that skill with that kind of skill level can't make free throws, but he really struggled on free throws. Uh, but no, he, he was a, a, a great point guard, started his career at Notre Dame, ended up at o Oklahoma state, uh, and became one of those Eddie Sutton guys for life. Uh, but that's just it. You would think somebody from that Eddie Sutton era would be out there and ready to come coach these guys and and uh it really it's a damn shame that sean sutton didn't work out right yeah you could have had uh you could have had a 40-year run of sutton head coaching um uh, because sean certainly had the i uh, the iq for it the basketball iq no question but he had his issues and uh that didn't work out but uh I, I don't know. It'll be it'll be really interesting to see how Chad Weiberg handles uh, this really really important hire. That is an important. It's a different kind of important hire, Tyler. Than we'll see at whatever point Mike Gundy decides to retire. Now that will be the all timer of an interesting process. And who knows when that might be? A couple yeah. of years, five more, eight more. I don't know. All right, guys, shall we leave it there or any final thoughts? Um, no, I, w I wish uh, – uh, uh, I'm hoping for Tyler – well, for all of our sake, I hope this 
See, here's what I'm thinking too, real quick, is that it's not like uh, a basketball situation sneaked up on Chad Weiberg in the last couple of weeks. This has been kind of brewing for a couple of years, right? So just because we can't come up with names or we don't have a list of really credible names that might get a look at that job, you got to think he does, right? You got to think Chad does. And and you know he's getting some help from a uh, some sort of a search firm. Um, Tulsa always goes to that Chicago firm every time they need to hire a coach. Uh, so uh, I was going to say, I just hope for, for Tyler's sake and, and really just because I want to see what the next, you know, the next step looks like. I hope it's a brief process and within 10 days, you know, that we're all over in Stillwater meeting a new Oklahoma state basketball coach, but it'll be interesting too. I see Chad Weiberg is a, is a bright guy and it won't shock me too. If he does, on the day they introduce a new coach, maybe unveil some sort of new collective for basketball. You know, um, I don't know. They, right now they just, what do they have, Tyler? They just have the pokes for the purpose. Is that what it's called? Uh, the collective pokes for the purpose. That, that's it. Yeah, that's it. Is that it? Yeah. I'm on a blank. But uh, I think I think maybe they might unveil something that's a little more basketball specific. Uh, and just say, hey, we do care about basketball. And, you know, this perception that, you know, we're a football school and we've bailed on basketball is garbage. And that's what I'd like to see. I'd like to see Chad say, stand up and say, BS, we do care about basketball. You know, we're going to get this right. That's what I'd like to see. Because OSU is a great, it, it was a great basketball school and that's a great building. And I'd love to see some of that heat get restored. Tyler, final thoughts? Um, I think my thought is just that, you know, I think it's, it's easy in the moment to, uh, especially for, for people like us covering it to sort of predict where things might go or, you know, you know, it's easy to say, well, the, either the future's bright or there's no hope. Um, I don't know. I, I grew up in the heart of the SEC at a time when, basketball didn't mean much to to most of the conference and i think a lot of people would say sec basketball is um one of the higher levels so i just i i I, i've seen i've i've watched programs even from year to year go from you know mediocre middle of the pack to all of a sudden competing at the conference level and the national level so I, i think there's always hope but i mean i think there's definitely some some big picture problems that Oklahoma State needs to address if it wants to get there. All right. Well, Bill, Tyler, appreciate the knowledge and insight very much. Uh, both Bill and Tyler will be on top of this, writing stories, doing all the great stuff that they do. Thank you for joining us, and be sure and check out TulsaWorld.com and the Tulsa World Daily Newspaper for updates. Thanks, guys.